Hi, my name is De Detective John Neville. I'm with Melbourne Police Department. I serve as the Digital Forensics Examiner for Melbourne Police Department. Today we're going to talk about the email reply doctrine. A lot of questions say, if somebody commits an offense, or maybe in a civil action, if you wanted to prove who is behind that phone when they're texting, sending messages, who's behind the device when they're sending emails, and the collection of evidence of those emails, how do you say, hey, for a fact, that was John Doe who sent me those text messages or those emails. Where there's a special law out there or a constitutional case law called uh, email reply doctrine. And that was looked at by the courts to say that uh, specific uh, appearance, contents, substance, internal patterns, or other distinctive characteristics taken in conjunction with circumstances. So the way you write a message and the way I write a message are two totally different ways. Now, if I were to send you a text message and I said, hey, Malcolm, uh, and you say, yeah, what's up, John? Well, guess what? John's the one who sent the message. And then we continue to look at the messages just in case somebody says, well, no, this isn't John. This is John's wife. There you go. You have it right there. It's very simple. You send an email. And you get a reply. You send an email to your business worker, or a coworker, or a friend, or a student, and you say, "Hey, I need some help with this work. Do you think you could get me chapter two, page one, and help me with my answers for my questions?" And they reply back, "Yes, chapter two, page one is this." That's obviously somebody who is in class with you, or somebody who you regularly email, and take in all those circumstances of the pattern how they write. And we're not talking about linguistics but how they write, whether, how they generally send their emails, if they use the word dog all the time, like they call you your dog, or if they spell for as foe, or if they spell a certain word specifically every time, like if they always include two L's and it's a word that only takes one. And you can show a consistent pattern that that's the way that they write their messages. Those are all the things that are taken in consideration, according to the Federal Rules of Evidence, on the email reply doctrine to say whether somebody had the device, they're the person behind the device, you no longer have to have a camera pointing at somebody, showing them with the device, sending messages at a specific date and time. Email reply doctrine is the way to go. Okay, so for example, if you have, say, a computer at, in a residence, and there's an allegation of, uh, say, uh, uh, child pornography or counterfeiting or whatever the crime is or whatever the offense is, uh, even if it's in the e-discovery world, the civil world, where there's uh, an indication of misbehaviors but from uh, one of the spouses, uh, if say for example you have a computer in a household, and say there's four people who live there, say two adults and two teenagers, well then you have four users. Well, the computer itself, does it have four user accounts? Or do all four users use the same account? That's where it's a little difficult, because as we know, computer, computer users that are signed on a computer use an SID number that is attached to every file and folder as part of that profile for the computer, or account for the computer. Uh, sometimes there are actually four different accounts uh, on a computer for four different users of a household. Uh, and if one of the accounts is named Bob, and the next account is called Wilma, and the next is called James, and the next is called John. If I'm investigating James, out of all four of those people, and I go into James's account and start looking things up, and I find evidence of a violation, then the files that he or she is using, uh, all I need to do is find out, uh, from a forensic standpoint, is whose SID number was attached to that file. And if it gives me James's accordance SID file number, I know that James is responsible for that file. We can believe that James is responsible for that file. So what if we have somebody say, well, James always uses my account, or I always use James's account. Sometimes it takes good old-fashioned people skills to find all this information out. You have to talk to people, get them locked into a statement. That way they can't go back and say, well, that's not what I meant, or maybe they'll come to you and say, eh, I wasn't really being really truthful. If you get people locked into the statement, first off, you can compare all the results and find out who's telling you the truth, and maybe they all are telling you the truth. But make sure there's no deceitfulness or untruthfulness to their statements. That way you know uh, 
uh, not only just using forensics as your tool, but you can also use the power of, the, of talking to somebody. So. What if you have a warrant for one person and they're using a shared computer? Can you search the entire computer or only that one account? No, the only way you can search is having consent or a search warrant. You ask the other parties if you have their permission to uh, to search through their account if the suspected person uh, is believed to be using their account for a, uh, a medium. Um, if they're not the person who's doing anything illegal, they usually don't have any problems with you letting go in there and go and get stuff that you need. Uh, so that's never usually never an issue. Uh, if it is an issue, usually that means that you can just apply for a search warrant and if you already have the device in your in your possession and you execute the search warrant do the forensic imaging and you have to your scope is specifically for that account if that's what your search warrant says you're allowed to search you got to remember the search warrant is designed to where you're searching and what you're searching for and anything electronically or devices how that device or electronic data ties into the case without that information your search warrant will not be approved Okay, when you're doing a search warrant, you have to specify exactly the media that you're going to be searching? The search warrants are so specific on where you're going to search and what you're going to search. Now, understand that there is, a, there is the thought of container, sub-container theory, which is believed that it's almost like a briefcase. If I ask for a search warrant for the briefcase, I can search the contents therein. But what am I searching for, right? Well, Malcolm told me that James keeps his drugs, his illegal drugs, and weapons inside the briefcase. So guess what I'm going to put on my search warrant for the briefcase? I want to search the briefcase for legal narcotics and weapons because James is a convicted felon. He's not allowed to have weapons, and of course illegal drugs are illegal, and with a person who's willing to be a witness in the case, that helps us develop probable cause, which is a requirement for the search warrant application. Hi, my name is Detective John Noble with Melbourne Police Department. Uh, today is a little bit of overview of the Tor and the Tor browser. And for a person in my position who's a digital forensics examiner, uh, the Tor browser is used to anonymously surf the internet. So you cannot be traced or tracked uh, back to your ind independent location. Uh, and they use uh, onions or circuits in order to kind of like proxy hop through different devices and routers that are throughout the world. Uh, it's a bit of slow connection, but it's uh, considered reliable and safe. Um, in my job, uh, the Tor network is used for people who are interested in purchasing um, uh, illegal items. And that's not saying that every Tor user is breaking the law or looking to buy things illegal, but in a sense that I'm a criminal investigator, what I'm finding is there are a lot of places on the tour that you, you can purchase illegal items, uh, narcotics, uh, weapons, uh, which if you try to buy a weapon on tour, it's going to be three times the amount uh, of the cost of just going to the gun store and buying a gun. Um, you can buy drugs, you can buy an assassin, you can hire an assassin. Um, you can be very specific on the quantity of drugs, uh, how you want it shipped, where you want it shipped, uh, if you get a good relationship with the seller and he makes good on his promise, um, then you know you can refer him to other clients. Generally, all the money that is used to purchase items from the tour are used in Bitcoin. Bitcoin fluctuates daily on the value of how much it is. So if uh, uh, one Bitcoin is worth $12, tomorrow it may be worth 14 or the next day it may be worth 6 it fluctuates up and down. It seems to be going up uh, from a historical point of view. So if you bought 20 Bitcoin at $110 uh, per Bitcoin 10 years ago, excuse me, 5 years ago, um, it, it's worth $364 per Bitcoin now. And there's about 20 million Bitcoins out there right now. More businesses are starting to accept Bitcoin as a portion of payment. Bitcoin doesn't operate with any banks. There's no banks involved. So you can set up Bitcoin through PayPal. You can set up Bitcoin uh, uh, to pay somebody or somebody to pay you with completely anonymous transactions, which makes it more difficult for us if we get a high-profile uh, digital electronics case. 
so that is what the tour network does, and that's how we deal with it in, as criminal investigators. In the world of digital forensics, we uh, can look at computer forensics, mobile forensics, all different types of forensics uh, to extract data, conduct analysis on it, and report it to whoever you need to report it to. In my job, I have to report to the courts. So while I'm extracting data, for example, if I'm using mobile forensics applications, I use Celebrite as my primary uh, uh, mobile forensics uh, capacity. So if I do an extraction on, say, a phone, say an iPhone or an Android phone, um, what's easier for me is Celebrite has a built-in function that creates a timeline for you. So if I'm looking for somebody who constantly messages people, calls people, has a call log, contact list, um, messages people on different applications, messenger on Facebook, WhatsApp, Hangouts, whatever it is, the timeline function can tell me exactly who that person was talking to and when they were talking to. And if criminal activity occurred in between the timeline, between one event and another event, I can you know, look at the message after in the timeline, later on in the timeline, and see if the person mentions what they were doing and get an idea that the person was there on scene, committed the crime, or used their device as a uh, uh, way to commit the crime, which is what they call an instrumentality of the crime. So uh, uh, the timeline feature is super helpful, and um, uh, computer forensics generally uses the same thing. They have timeline functions with FDK, uh, field toolkit by access data uh, that you can put all of the activity, all the files, all the things that were saved, all the things that were open, put those in timelines as well to figure out what the person was looking at last on that computer or what they saved last or the documents that they opened last or where they were at on the internet and what they were looking for. So if I, if I get involved in a case of say serial burglars that target AC or refrigeration uh, companies in the city. I can look in their profiles in their phones or laptops or whatever they're carrying and see that they were searching for locations that sell AC refrigeration and the hours that they're open and uh, get all kinds of useful information for the case agents to put together a story for the state attorney's office. Hello there, my name is Detective Noble with the Melbourne Police Department. Today we're going to talk about cross-site tracking. Cross-site tracking is a technique that's used by cyber forensics examiners and investigators to, to track people who've committed crimes online and to track them through various social media outlets and various websites. Uh, for example, uh, Ross Albright, who was the starter of Silk Road, um, first started out on a website called shroomery.org and he made a post there with a certain username. And that username was tied to a Google Plus account, was tied to a YouTube account, which was tied to him, which tied to his LinkedIn account, which gave a full profile of who he was. Um, they verified that he was the person who started all this was living in California because the, all the posts were giving Pacific, uh, Pacific time. Um, so they were able to focus their investigation over in California. They verified by his YouTube account that he shared an apartment at first with a roommate who also went by a certain name. Um, so after uh, Albright was arrested, they put their investigation together and they were able to track exactly what his movements are all the way to Silk Road, uh, making the, um, uh, ordering the illegal documents and things like that. So eventually what he got caught for. But, um, you know, you can, on Silk Road, you can buy drugs, you can buy uh, weapons, you can buy assassins, you can buy uh, illegal documents, There's everything is for sale there, child pornography. Uh, and so the federal government came in and shut down Silk Road 1, and uh, Albright was convicted last year and received, I think, a 20 year sentence uh, for his activities. Um, so it's very popular when in the criminal investigation realm where somebody uses a specific username that can be tracked across multiple platforms, uh, social media, different websites, even the dark net. Um, 
most of these offenders are people who want to do it for recognition, uh, especially when they're younger. So uh, if they upset so many people, especially if they upset a friend, a friend will release their real information and we wouldn't even have to do any work. Uh, in the past, it's been common that 13 to 14 year old children are conducting these activities and they're using other people's software, pe legitimate people who use uh, penetration testing software. They're using uh, distributed denial of service software packages that are designed for pen testing or data overload testing um, or benchmark testing and they're using it for shutting systems down or creating zombie networks. So uh, that's a really good technique uh, that's used in the field uh, to track a suspect uh, or his group of committing certain offenses.